Okay, do we have other questions? Sister Sheila, that's right. Uh, Luke 16, verse 8 and 9. All righty, let's go over there. Luke 16. So actually, that is a very difficult passage. So let's look at the book of Luke, chapter 16. So it's a difficult passage because it seems to show that we are to, one, that we are to follow the wicked, and then two, that uh, this everlasting habitation, we have no idea what that is. All right, so the question is, for onliners who didn't hear, the question is, if you look at the book of Luke chapter 16, what is the interpretation to that? That's basically the question, okay? And then I'll cover the two issues over here. So Jesus is speaking about a parable here, about a story of an unjust steward. Verse 1, And he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Uh, we'll jump to verse uh, 5, uh, verse 4. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, <clears throat> and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, An hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, uh, and write fourscore. And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Ah, so notice right here, so far at verses 1 through 7, the story goes that basically this steward is unjust. Okay? But this unjust sewer was very, very clever. And the great example is today's Americans. So we don't like to do hard work. Sometimes we don't want to go by rules. So then we come up with something clever, right? So we come up with something clever. Basically, at verse 4 and 5, he's making friends with everybody over here. And then he calls the Lord's debtors. And then by accumulating each of the Lord's debtors of their money, then he already has enough where his Lord can't find anything wrong with him, actually. So, verse 8, Jesus says the children of this world are wiser than the children of light, which is very, very true. An easy example is this. An easy example is when you look at college students, it's amazing how many Bible-believing Christians are intimidated by the professors and students so they don't have the courage or the ability to be able to go on par with them and lead them to salvation. They feel like that basically that, you know what, just ignore them, uh, just ignore their arguments, and then, you know, just focus on people who would uh, be more concentrated on the gospel. You got to think about this. You got to think about, no, you got to minister to everybody. Jesus says in Mark 16, give the gospel to every creature. So, you got to realize this. A great example is your pastor here. Your pastor, because he went through that higher education garbage, he's able to go on par with a lot of these, not just students, but even professors, and uh, uh, not just professors, but even scholars, whether in person or in online. And your pastor's been attacked by that, right? But I'm able to go on par. Why? Because you got to know the thinking of this wicked world, how they use technology how they use education. If you don't learn to do what the wicked world does, you're gonna die out real quick because this is Satan's government and world system. You gotta know how they're running and working so you can survive. For example, if you don't know how this wicked world works, then our church would no longer be planted here. That's right. You might say, why? Because they would probably arrest us, shut off street preaching, nobody would uh, uh, give us the building where we can uh, use it for our church services. Why? Because you got to know how they think. you got to be wise like them. Yeah. Not only that, a lot of these liberal activists, they're finding a lot of new methods to be able to recruit a lot of people. And it's very, very successful. But a lot of Bible-believers, they're not learning that system. Right. Not only that, there are mega churches. They grow big for a reason. Mm -hmm. 
because they're looking at a lot of wisdom of this world to build up their churches. So don't get me wrong, Bible believers should not follow the methods when it's fleshy and sinful and worldly, but there are plenty of methods and tactics we can learn from them how we can build up a church. See that? So that's what you got to think about. You got to realize that this is a wicked world that we live in, and you got to be better. Uh, you got to be as wise, if not better, if not better, and craftier than these people. You might say, why is that? Because Jesus already warned you that be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I send you forth as sheep in the midst of what? Wolves. So it's so Satan is known as the serpent who's very crafty and clever. Christians got to be better than that. So you, got, so you didn't realize that, huh? So you got to realize that. Now, here is the issue, though. So we can see the positive trait over here, but the issue is what our sister mentioned, these two verses. Verse 8, And the Lord commended the unjust steward. Uh, excuse me, I already read verse 8. So verse 9, And I say unto you, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Okay, issue 1, that when, they, that when he fail they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Issue two. So one verse has two issues. So uh, some pastors, they teach that basically, which is ridiculous, and you can find this in your modern versions too, which has a problem. So I would encourage you to look at the famous modern versions or any modern version Bible. They basically point out that at verse 9, you're supposed to make friends uh, of, of the wicked world's money system. But actually, no, that's wrong. What you got, it's not being friends of the wicked world's money system. It's make yourselves friends. See that? So that's people of the mammon of unrighteousness. It's those people, see, who make the money. Because how do you know that? Because look at context. If you look at context, verse 5, 6, and 7, these are the friends who make money. See that? So these are the people who make the, these are the people who make the money. So if you make friends with these people, notice that they will practically save your life. See that? So this is an undoubtable fact. As much as Christians like to harp on separation, you got to be careful of ultra legalism where you separate from anything and anybody. It's impossible to be separated from anything and anybody. The easiest example is if you have an unsaved child or an unsaved uh, spouse, there is no way you can separate from that. See? Uh, so you have to look at the context of situations. For example, if you need money at a job, right? But you can't separate from every lost person in there. So you have to build a partnership, work, working friends. Why? So that you can get paid and you can work in there. See? It doesn't mean that you have to be like, oh, we're best friends. But there's a limitation. There are always limitations, levels of fellowship and separation. The easy example is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He had levels of separation and fellowship. For, uh, with, uh, with he, for the Samaritan woman who had like several different husbands, what did the Lord Jesus Christ do? He didn't separate from her. What did he do? He fellowshiped. Why? Not to be, oh, we're best buddies and friends. And no, he fellowshiped to lead her to salvation. As a matter of fact, he even fellowshiped with Pharisees, the people who he ripped in half in Matthew 23. But you'll notice that there were limitations on that one. He was rebuking the Pharisee too within the dinner table. See, so there are always limitations within fellowship and separation. So you've got to do that. Why? Because I guarantee if you don't practice that, I guarantee, I promise you this, everybody in this room practices that. I, I'm pretty sure, if not everybody. If I'm wrong about that, then I'm wrong, but practically everybody does that. Why? So that you can get some benefit from them. When you go to a restaurant, you don't separate from lost people. If it's an unsaved waiter, what do you do? You be friendly to the person so that why? So that they can serve you a good meal, for example. See, everybody is making friends with somebody. But see, it's building that connection that is important. Now, here's the problem, though. Okay, so let's go one by one over here. Okay, let's do this quickly. I didn't really write down anything over here. Okay. Uh, friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Okay. All right, now, now look at the next part here, okay? The next part is the issue. 
that when ye fail, right? Because look at context. So context is very important. So Jesus said the parable at verses 1 through 7. So it is important if you want to find the interpretation of verse 9, you compare the wordings with the parable at verse 1 through 9, 1 through 8. Now look at the similarity. So we found out the friends because of the, uh, from Luke chapter 16, right? The, the Lord's debtors, friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Now look, that when he failed, we know it failed at verses uh, 2 through 4, right? Uh, verse 1 through 4, right? So the steward failed in not being faithful. That's why it's called the parable of the unjust steward, right? So because that he failed in that one, look at this part. They may receive you into everlasting habitations. So following the context of they, it's referring to the same people. See that? Mm -hmm. So this is they. Receive you into what? Everlasting habitations. How are they going to receive you into such everlasting habitations? So there are a few uh, theories on this one, actually, that I'm going to give. All right? All right. If you look at context of, uh, of the parable, look at this. So friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, these are the Lord's debtors, right? So we saw that one. These are the Lord's debtors. Let's see how they do this, right? They receive this unjust steward into everlasting habitations. Look at this. Verse 4, I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, right, fail, that when he fail, they may what? Receive me into their houses. See that? So that's what we can see over here. This can refer to their houses here. But why would it say everlasting, right? Well, the thing is this, is that how it works is this way. A lot of people don't, uh, don't realize that one of the rules of interpretation in the Bible, which is very helpful, is taking the word as it says, right? If you look at the word, so let's look at word by word, then we can see it. If you look at word by word, what you're going to find out over here is that you see the word everlasting. See that? So then, if you look, okay, so everlasting, you can't just automatically assume after that. See, so you got to study, analyze every word. If you look up, uh, there's another rule of interpretation of scripture. It's called scripture with scripture. So if you look up every word that shows up everlasting, what you're going to find out is this. It's not what you think it is as forever without end. That's what you're going to find out that's interesting. And I would highly recommend, if you don't believe me, I would highly recommend you to look up every word that talks about everlasting. That's why... So this is very important to understand. That's why Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah Witnesses, this is the kind of verses they're going to use on you. This is not just this. They're going to find other verses about everlasting. They're going to find other words that has something like this to prove that everlasting does not mean forever without end. That's what they're going to do. So you need to be prepared for that. Concerning about hellfire, everlasting, and forever and ever, right? So you got to be prepared for those kind of arguments which I already gave to you a long time ago. So anyway, everlasting, it basically, it basically means uh, forever without end. And there are other definitions of terms where it shows basically without end during that person's life okay. or a long period of time indefinitely, etc. long duration. Because why? This is a kind of term that, are, that is used. Sometimes we talk about uh, an everlasting love when it comes to what? The person that we love. But obviously, that's not forever without end. It's marriage till death do us part, right? So we got to understand this, these kind of terms. So it can refer to long periods of time, so to speak. So think about this. That makes a lot of sense. So all the way till the end of time, so to speak, or the end of their lives, they can receive you into their home when you build up such connections, right? That's why such wisdom is necessary. The world is already doing that. You got to realize how did these uh, LGBTQ plus and all these kind of stuff, these, uh, the rise of liberalism, et cetera, how did they grow so big? You know why? They build connections. Right. So this is very important. You got to learn to build connections. Otherwise, Satan's system will grow more powerful and we grow, we grow weaker. See that? Okay. Another thing is this. 
This could be referring to heaven. So if this refers to heaven, so that's the second one. So um, one, uh, I better use blue here. One, this one. Second, if, if this is referring to heaven, think about this. Wouldn't God bless uh, your habitation, your eternal inheritance up in heaven when you use wisdom that glorifies him, mm -hmm. especially wisdom that wins souls to salvation? Didn't you know that? Uh, Paul said, I caught you craftily with guile. See, like that wise as a serpent, the wisdom of the world, but it was used to lead them to salvation. See that? So that's a very great example. So using the wisdom of this world that can glorify God, God would naturally build up your rewards in heaven. That's why it is essential for Bible believers that they've got to know how this world works. They got to learn how this wisdom of this world works. Otherwise, they will always have the excuse to look down on you as being uneducated, as being stupid, as being ignorant. These people don't know what they're talking about. But actually, no, we want to turn the tables on them and show them, no, despite the tens of thousands of dollars that you pay for higher education, you're still stupid and dumb. We want to point that out to them compared to the word of God, yeah. see? So we want to show them the folly of that compared to the word of God. And we got to prove that. That way they're without excuse at the judgment. So this can point out to the fact that, what they, that by doing this, building connections with them, this can build up more of our rewards in heaven. And it could possibly refer to where if you build such connection with them, they could get saved. And then when you see them up, in, when you see them up into heaven, they can receive you. And then you can be rewarded. See? So that is the second interpretation. Anyway, so uh, that's the answer to that question. Amen.